So welcome everybody uh, to the Marbury Seder, Seder Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY. My name is Frank Henschmann, the director of the programs here, the executive director. It's a, uh, a, a great place, we think, uh, where um, the practice and theory of the theater uh, meet and where you talk about what you do and why. And um, I think that is important that next to the what we also do focus on the why. And, um, and the center of our mission is bridging academia and professional theater, international American theater. And this project, the Japan Playwright Project, the Japanese Playwright Project, is very, very close to our heart. Ten years ago, we started it uh, with four writers. Toshiki Okada was one of them. His first time he came, come out. And many other significant writers came with him. And uh, thanks to Aya Ogawa, who was over there, I know, say hello, who helped us to co-produce it, to create it. She translated many of the plays and is so engaged also in our discussions here, so again, I would like to thank Aya for uh, helping us to, to, to restart it, re, um, re, uh, redo it. Um, it has been a fantastic day one. Yesterday we had three brilliant readings, I think, a truly extraordinary New York um, artist that worked with the Japanese uh, uh, writers, and we have high expecta expectations here at the Seagull Center, but I think all the readings uh, were a stunning example that exceeded that, and that's not easy um, to do. Um, we really would sincerely like to thank uh, the Japan Foundation, and uh, uh, it really has been uh, uh, made possible through them, through their trust. And what we do, we have done many, many uh, projects together, and I think that's also the reason they said, please do go ahead. Even it was 100% clear who the writers were. There were two boards of advisors, one in Japan, who selected out of, I think, 20 plays, uh, plays so they suggested 20 plays. And then a New York board that said, what would work in New York? How would a theme connect and uh, other variety of plays. So a lot of work went into that, and I really would like also to thank everybody who served on those um, committees. And um, the Japan Foundation did give out a little questionnaire, which we forgot to do yesterday. I apologize, so please do write something in it. And take a couple of minutes. I think it's also respectful. It really, really wouldn't happen without them. They could bring the writers in here. So the Japan Foundation has been um, uh, instrumental, and there's Kenji Matsumoto, I'm glad I just said it when he came in. Uh, he's uh, our great uh, supporter and a significant leader of, of that foundation that worldwide really contributes. And I think is a model for um, an artistic exchange like uh, the French Cultural Service, the Goethe, and others. But it's very special, I think, what they do here. We also welcome our, the Japan Society, who is here, Yoko Shoya, who helped us, and, and, many, and many others. So um, we now come to day two, the two last readings, um, and they're all here in, in your programs. Um, so please do take your um, phone out. It should be on mute. We'll do the same. Is it all off? So it um, should not ring. And uh, tonight, after the 7 o'clock reading, which would be, I think, an hour, we all will go to the archive bar, which is around the corner on 36. The address is in here, I think, number 14. East uh, 36th Street, the playwrights will be there. I hope our supporters, so it's always a fun event and you can talk about life and theater and projects that have nothing to do with us, but lots of stuff has happened there, so please do join us. And um, I would now to uh, uh, invite Zara to speak a bit about the play. She directed it with the great Tony Torn, who is here with us. So, um, Zara. And, and, and you die, of course, we forgot. Here's the you die who's over there. Can you raise your arm? So he flew in uh, from uh, Japan um, to be with us uh, just for a couple of days. It's his second time. He came to our Penwell Voices reading two years ago, a brilliant play about visiting his grandmother in, uh, in Peru. Fantastic work, what he did, and this is a follow-up. So we are really honored. He just got a very significant, the highest prize in Japan for his playwriting. So it's truly a great honor that he is here with us. So thank you. Hi, I'm Sarah. Um, I won't say very much, uh, but uh, yeah, just uh, really excited to be back here um, and share this work with you. Um, I had the pleasure of directing a um, uh, reading of uh, You Die's other play at the Penn World Voices Festival. Um, so I'm, it's been really a thrill to come back to um, work by the same playwright, um, dealing with some of the same themes of um, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to have a nation? Um, what does it mean to be displaced? Uh, which is some of the stuff that we're dealing with here, hopefully in a humorous and delightful way. Um, so enjoy the show. A meeting with God.
it is difficult to discern who is human. The humans keep changing their plans. They are late, and they keep arriving gradually, one after another. A long time passes since the first human has arrived. Finally, everyone is there. Until then, they wait. My subjects, as you know, I am king of this island. But before battle, I want to prepare you one last time for what is to come. That fateful day is now long gone, but that was when failure was born. Yes, that was indeed failure. Everything began that day. There was a fishing rod somewhere. That day, no matter how long I waited, I could not catch a single fish on my line. Why in the world not? Once in a while, I would catch garbage, pieces of rubber, objects that could pass, possibly pass for discarded furniture, or someone's photograph of forgotten people, paper scraps of memories, the dregs of dregs. There was only a mountain of garbage surrounding me. I fished garbage, and my arms traveled down the fishing pole. Under the gloomy sky, surrounded, shrouded in clouds, as I waited for the hollow sun to pierce through the sky, slumber infected me from my fishing pole. And pursued by garbage, I fell asleep in the shallows. It was a very deep slumber. It was fatigued from having been sacrificed in the name of civilization. The carefree era, before we knew fatigue, had long passed. And I was overtaken by a fatigue that could not be resisted. A fatigue you couldn't possibly imagine. Consciousness quiets its breath, and an unnoticed calm draws close. It was a slumber in which any remaining bliss and tired joy slipped away. It's as if somebody flipped a switch, and everything went black and I plunged into the abyss. It was impossible to resist. The waters were gentle and graceful like a hawk at rest. And I was sucked into a giant whirlpool of time that was churning backwards. Oh, my head was as heavy as a dumbbell. How long had I slept? It was a deep slumber. It was a slumber unshaken by ocean currents that could have torn my body apart. A slumber in undisturbed, even as if my navel had somersaulted. Calculating 1,000 years as one hour, I had slept for 500 hours. No, no, no. It felt like an unfathomably long period of time. When I awoke, the gentle earth had disappeared. There was only ocean in sight. I lived a tiny existence among garbage in vast waters. Several times, thrown by violent storms and heavy rains, I felt myself lost in time, reversing course, and then I'd launch myself back into the mercy of the ocean. But no matter what, night would come. They say destiny is made of water and wind. Not the water that quenches thirst, nor any wind that follows orders. I'm thirsty! Give me some drinking water! Thirst overcomes me. Like a blade, thirst tears my whole body apart. There is only blackness, and the moon glows. Isn't anyone there on this ocean? Anybody? I want someone to talk to. There was only the moonlight and the sound of the wind. Doesn't that sound like the sound of someone's voice? 
Doesn't that sound like the sound of someone's voice? Just now, in the gentle wind, a calm wave, didn't I hear a voice? Didn't I see a figure in the wind? Thirst overcomes me, darkness. I've been cast off by the world. A moonlight shines on me and creates my shadow. I long to see the shadow of someone who will offer me drinking water that I had slept so luxuriously is now strangling me. Time is my only attorney, and I await the verdict. Once I was an angel, but I find myself wingless and therefore flightless, if only I had wings. I was embarrassingly pathetic as I drifted on the sea and slumber was a thing of the past. They say destiny is made of water and wind, but this wind water will not quench my thirst and the wind will carry me nowhere. I can't see. I kept drifting and I never saw land. I embraced a boulder of despair, utterly powerless. I was neither man nor woman. I was hungry. Give me meat, I can eat a boiled egg, anything. But I already knew that no one was there. I was in a prison where I could not even make a noise. You know, my subjects, things do not always just happen suddenly. Everything happens at a certain time, at a certain place, for a reason. So remember that, if those minds of yours had that capacity. It was truly the matter of a moment. If I were not your king, surely I would not be here right now. It was only the matter of a moment. A great yellow bird, the likes as though I'd never seen before, with a beak like a bright red banana and red round eyes like apples, this monstrous bird appeared as if covering me as I awaited my verdict. And with its red beak, it snapped at my body. In shock, I shouted out words that I had prepared. My time has come, or perhaps it was, the end is nigh. I begin to feel as though I was being skewered lengthwise, as if burning in hell's fire. Before I could understand what was happening, I was wounded at death's door. But as I am an angel, I escaped without fatal injury. <laughs> and with superhuman strength, strength and endurance, I escaped into the water. The water was warmer than I had expected. And I knew I had drifted south. In the dark black waters, there were countless white, thin threads, and there were numerous layers within the water. In the midnight sea, I was sea foam. First my ears began to hurt, and then my eyes. The sea water soaked through my whole body like needles and daggers. But before I sank into the depths, I spoke to the bird that attacked me. Since I have no wings now, I am a victim to the storms. Your king, whom you come to greet, is going to sink in this spot. Muttering such words, I sank. Sarah Morgan. When this king who knew no defeat, succumbed to defeat. The bird's remorseful cry skimmed over the waters, and my body grew heavy. The water was heavy. I reached a layer of icy waters, and again, I lost consciousness. There I was in the freezing water, without air, without a flotation device. And the bird spoke. There are times when I feel peace amid the debris. But what in the world are you supposed to be? You are just here without purpose? I am the subject of these perceptions. And you, mere momentum. There is no purpose to existence, so you ought to remain there, frustrated. I don't understand! Someone bring me some water. Water! Hurry! <laughs> ah. 
I am the chosen one. That much is certain. I am the earth itself which the sun, on which the sun shines. I know what rumors have spread among you wretches. It's as if I have 65 years. You should know best that even the sound of crawling earthworms, none of that escapes me. Make no noise. You have disturbed my sleep countless times. You beasts who have not even an ounce of grace in your gate. I'll let you hear this straight from thy lips, this mouth this morning. Today is a good day for you to die. As a parting gift, I will tell you something. Now, in the land where the sun shines, even the smallest happening and the smallest rows are named. And everything is kept really immaculately clean. So every street dusts itself off, and sweat is made to evaporate in a moment. A clean street is indicative of a clean heart. And the likes of you would not even be permitted to step outside. Anything that falls off the earth is discarded. So be grateful to me that you are permitted to mingle and feed yourselves here. Rejoice in this privilege. My subjects, you pitiful creatures, know nothing of cleanliness. You have no idea how difficult it was to construct everything that you take for granted. Encountering me has been your life's greatest joy and treasure. Much time has passed. I cannot even begin to speak of the hardships of nerd. I bled tears to provide you with such comfort. I almost shed pure tears thinking about it. Of course, a a as king, uh, <laughs> I value this place, my kingdom. In fact, I, I am rather fond of this place. The view, the air. Compared to my ideal, it it's not much. <laughs> but <laughs> trees that only grow here line the landscape. And bats that can only be seen with infrared light. Perch on every branch. Those bats celebrate me without rest. The sky is clear as always, and some rain may fall this evening. Gazing down to the smooth slope of the hill, I see friends of many lives. The blue, red, and yellow flowers blooming on the green, the bees. Oh, oh, and my favorite, the hermit crab that walks to and fro for countless hours. If I pet the hermit crab's skull, it hides its head, and after a while, it reappears and walks again. It is a yellow, white treasure. <laughs> My favorite pastime is to read with a grace that uh, resembles, like, it's like reclining on the sand. The blue sky squeezed by the ends of my eyelashes and listening to the sound of that wind that follows no order. You must never forget to soak up knowledge. My subjects, even I, who possess a clear mind and a broad perspective, who will never forget the importance of time spent in quiet, even I never hesitate to deepen my learning. You must train yourselves to become more like me, uh, from the tips of your toes to the tops of your heads. Of course, every piece of writing on this island has been imported from somewhere else. I know there are objections to this. Oh, well, how happy you'd be if you were able to produce writings of your own. <laughs> In any case, I will never cease to devour books. The cruel hateful ocean was so gentle on the shores of the natural bay. How I disappeared into the black ocean, only to arrive here, I'll never know. My body was bloated and soaked, and I barely had any oxygen. Yet I pulled my powerful body and spirit together, rose up, and let out a shot. For a while, I enjoyed my time alone, although it was an amount of time that would have driven you all insane. 
unconscious time unfurled before me endlessly. An endless amount of time unfurled before me unconsciously. One could say it was an innumerable amount of time. And I simply and silently waited for time to pass. At the end of my endless meditation, I felt the sensation like a balloon being inflated, and I regained my consciousness. I had expanded to my utmost limit, and looking around with my terribly heavy body, the waves carried a new, never-before-seen landscape towards me, where the greens of trees were drawn like toothpick against the yellow-blue sky. The question was, when was I? As I gazed at the waves lapping on the shores, I bore my solitude and thirst, and I was at a loss when I encountered your first leader, number one. I was moved, deeply moved, and I greeted him very politely and carefully. I finally met a human being! It's so nice to meet you! I, I don't know you, but I, I expect you to treat me with respect, since I am an angel from the land of the sun. And also, could I trouble you for a glass of water? Uh, the thirst of my throat is the thirst of the earth. <laughs> the thir thirst of the earth is the thirst of the heavens. If you have fresh water, that's all I need right now. Um, I have no idea where I am. Where are we? Uh, judging from, from the position of the sun, uh, we seem to be in the south, but I cannot discern exactly. When did you come here? How long have you lived here? Are there any humans like you? Uh, and also, um, I want you to bring me anything else that has nourishment besides water. No, l let me soak in nourishment. Without nourishment, I'll never be able to fly again. Now, now memory is a living thing, so this might be a bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> but uh, that's pretty much what, pretty much what I said, the gist of what I said. Uh, and, I, and, and to think that number one, your leader, <laughs> I was shocked to learn, to learn in time that number one was the lonely head of your village. But the truth is, he was a primitive man that hardly understood language at all. And, and, and I was shocked, as if pierced by an arrow. Shocked to the depth of my dreams. Shocked so much that on my surprise, I went deaf. I went deaf. Where and when was I? I could not move. Then your leader, pitiful as snot, raised an animal cry <laughs> and uttered some meaningless sounds, <laughs> stomping his feet. What are you doing? <laughs> then in the sky, that same yellow bird that attacked me in the dark seas appeared from the shadows of the clouds. And your leader, whose wretchedness I cannot speak of without weeping, that he carries with him in a suitcase wherever he goes, cry out again, as if imitating the bird's cry. <laughs> and trembling, stripped himself naked at blinding speed, ran around till his feet were caught in the sand, and he fell, and he dug himself down in the sand to hide, but he could not conceal himself. You can do it, number one! <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, the bird, without so much as a greeting, tore at me with its beak and flew about freely. It flew from beach to rocky cliff, where it hopped from mossy boulder to mossy boulder, and then stomping on the grass, it escaped into the forest and spoke. If you envy my wings to allow me to fly freely, you must think again. You must reassess your values. Is it right truly for you? to revere that which is not rooted to the earth? Then the bird let out an extremely self-satisfied cry, like a mad circus, and disappeared somewhere. As I caught my breath in the forest, under the forest floor made of many years of fallen leaves, there was an unearthly glow coming from an enormous serpent 
that must have been 3,000 years old. I locked eyes with the serpent. And then, while time beyond the world passed, as if I was in a sleeping embrace, and finally the serpent spoke. As one enduring creature to another, I thank you. Because if you were not here, I wouldn't be here either. It is easy to forget gratitude in our daily lives. So from time to time, I express it through words. The only thing I possess as instinct is to flee from enemies. The snake had praised me, and then it disappeared. <laughs> and what happened next? You all know. I dragged number one out of a sandy hole and revived him from a state of suspended animation. And then, uh, uh, it took time for us to really understand each other, uh, but finally I taught him how to speak language. And it took time for us, and finally I learned of your existence. And uh, it, 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 I had no expectations of you, but I built you a school so I could teach you all to speak human language to introduce you to the technology called language. And then I assign useful numbers to your nameless masses because I cannot tell your beastly faces apart. And I taught you the meaning of numbers. I taught you to count and how, how you grew to love numbers. You with carefree smiles, you called out each other's numbers. <laughs> how beautiful. In this galaxy, there cannot be too much beauty. When I close my eyes in beauty, I always see myself next to you. So always cherish the heart that appreciates beauty. Yes, this island is beautiful. It is unbelievably lustrous and gorgeous, if I do say so myself, like a school of tiny fish or the gentle waves or the flower-like turtles that climb into the land of life. I love the landscape I see here. Oh, number two and four. <laughs> My first students, you sat next to each other side by side with the handmade desks at the school. I instructed you sternly and patiently, though you never improved. I even had you build a hospital because you always injured yourself out of carelessness. <laughs> you were all so excited, and then you became bored. Number eight and number 16. I caught you throwing away building materials. I howled and I forced you to work with murderous fervor, but it was all for you. Now, I was building this hospital for you. You learned what it meant to uh, sweat from labor for the first time. Never forget the sweat. And you experienced firsthand what medical treatment was. Uh, I changed my, I challenged my life experiences head on by seizing a memory, wandering in the fourth dimension, and, and, and produced legitimate natural medicine, far surpassing anything that you might be thought possible by the amateur I was. By watching me, you made your own drugs, and you prescribed them, and, uh, and you drooled from the excitement of this experience, like flying for the first time. And I couldn't hold back my tears when your addiction to drugs brought you down. <laughs> and I being an angel, I invoked a typhoon and, and, uh, and beat you down with the whips of love and desire. I had to teach you simpletons from the beginning to know what pain is. And each time I beat you down, my heart was also pained. I cut down the forest and turned it into an athletic field for you to strengthen your bodies. I, I saw that you always gave up right away. I, I tied your ankles with ivy and threw you into the water. Soon you began to feed on competition. Many of you grew faster and used your newfound speed to steal each other's possessions. That's why I had to build you a prison. It was inevitable. The, the, the prison is something each of you should have rooted individually in your hearts. However, trees were felled and a prison was constructed. I oversaw it all. What did it demand of me? I accomplished more than what was thought possible every day. 
It was very, very, very taxing. And uh, I was always thinking, how could I ingrain the smallest amount, even an ounce of what could be called knowledge, into your nightmarishly wretched minds? <laughs> Number 32, do you remember? First day, I had an idea, and I called upon you to create a secret field. It was a clear, sunny day like today, and I thought I'd chosen the perfect day, although there was a sudden rainstorm. Oh, cruel God! I'd chosen that day to realize my magnificent plan. If you had made rain, I refuse to believe in God. God is nothing but a liar in the shape of a man. In comparison, despite my days of painstaking work, I had the gift of ceaseless thought due to my meticulous genius. Now, even you, when the rains beat my tears into my face, I had conviction. I knew what I had to do to plant wisdom in you. Yes. It was to change your diet. I would change your food and change your bodies. The field is the food. The field is the school for food. Number 32. You and I committed the task of working on the field. And we delighted in the idea of keeping it secret from the others so we could surprise them with the results. However, number 32, you had no idea what a field was, <laughs> and you pissed him in. <laughs> now, I don't know if whether your incontinence uh, stemmed from fear of me or your incredible insolence, but you stood in the middle of the field with a creepy smile and let your urine flow. <laughs> you made an incomprehensible sound as you pissed. <laughs> Silence! If you cannot be silent, kill me! Oh, that's right, you cannot kill me. <laughs> Just like the bird. That he could never kill me either. However, number 32, you were not mistaken in the end. I have to admit that your urine was good fertilizer for the people. <laughs> Oh, calm down, my subjects. No, no, the legendary th number 32 is not the only one. Rejoice, all of you who stand before me as warriors. All your urine fertilized the fields that grew our vegetables. But number 32, you do nothing about farming. You planted yellow fish from the sea in the field. <laughs> and uh, I thought I'd warned you against it countless, countless times, but you, you yanked out seedlings that had just taken root. And although one must be diligent in patrolling the fields on rainy days, I'd find you lying in bed masturbating. <laughs> Our crops would not grow. <laughs> uh, in the third season, we finally had vegetables to harvest, and you embraced me when you saw that. I thought I'd finally begun to understand you for the first time since I arrived, all of you, uh, until I saw the field utterly destroyed. The next morning, I caught you, number 32, in the bathroom eating radishes you stole during the night. <laughs> I vowed to hunt you down to the ends of the earth. I looked as though I had devoured a demon you looked as though you'd been torn apart by one. In a panic, you fell into Birth Pain River beyond Tempio Hill. You didn't surface from the river for a long time. Time passed. Would I ever see you again? I was already beginning to give up. But then, what surfaced from the river was not you, 32, but that creature. 
What did you drop in the river? A gold human or a silver human? Was it an indigenous species or a foreign one? I fear you. One day you might skin me, auction off my hide, throw my flesh into the river and use my eyeballs as jewelry. You might kill and burn my family. You may talk endlessly at the bottom of the river, clinging to your shameful past self, ignorant of language, cut off my nipples and caress me smiling like a civil servant in an endless game of pretend with a wet curtain. Other divers might gaze on upon us, holding their breath, grinning as you do with me whenever you wish, using nonsense words, flailing your arms in nonsense ways. Now, I could not understand what the aged alligator was trying to say. Had it mistaken me for someone else? Nothing good comes of old age. How absurd. You were permitted to occupy this river by permission of me, your king. You were completely unaware as you live out your old age. The 10,000-year-old alligator came ashore as if it were tired of speaking. It moved sluggishly, its back overgrown with moss. A cretin. Every step it took, it drooled, green and red. The afternoon sun was red, red and unrelenting. And that's when that guy arrived. Somebody bring me fire! <laughs> the sin of my failure is grave. It took uh, only a few days after the alligator devoured number 32 following an afternoon rain. You had all gathered on Hermit Crab Beach, and they were making a racket. So it was, it's prohibited to gather and tamper with the beach. Distress, I made you disperse. And I found a perfumed man washed up on the shore. Hoxborough. Hoxborough was face down in the sand, his breath labored. He too likely ended up here trying to escape that bird. The depth of my compassion is deeper than the length of all the tunnels of all the world connected together. I ordered Hoxborough to be taken to a hospital. Uh, number 64! Or someone! Please give him some drinking water, because I know that is all he wants. And, and do not let yourself be possessed, but with any strange superstition that would allow you to take Hoxabird down to the river to be eaten by that alligator. No, that prehistoric creature should just die. The man needed swift and attentive treatment. I believe that this would be the first being that would ever fully understand the depths of my heart. I have the utmost affection for a man I, I had never seen before. Haxaburo hadn't slept for three days, and, I, I, and nights I tend to him with devotion. The time Haxaburo's plump belly was a steel sword with floral etching. Its blade was so sharp that <laughs> number 64 almost cut all of uh, his fingers off of his right hand, trying to steal it. And then everyone feared the sword, and there was no attempt to steal it again. Days of sleepless care continued, <laughs> and resulted in nothing short of tragedy. And it was all due to my negligence. I, who hold all the power on this island, I, I, I can offer no excuses. I hereby make an apology to you, my subjects, for the first time. It is true that even I, your master, could not have prevented this tragedy. However, I proclaim that I regret what happened upon my honor as an angel, it was a sad mistake. 
It, it was a result of me wanting a like-minded companion. Nay, it was the result of Hoxaburo's sad tears. I never doubted that he'd been sent to me as a gift from the gods. But I was sorely mistaken. If only I could have changed the seas. However, what remained the greatest mystery is what happened to my fingers. Laden with a sense of responsibility over my youthful follies, after the incident, I chopped off my left hand at the wrist. And I threw it into the ocean. However, after one night of shallow sleep, when I woke to a nightmarish moaning from my golden bed, I found that I had grown a new hand. Strange indeed, my fine, bold, new left hand fit me without any trouble and spoke to me. <laughs> as I tell you this, as I speak before you, my subjects, I bear the truth as of climbing a mountain, so let me tell you to you straight. After I cut off my hand, I entertained the idea of leaving the throne. <laughs> the loss of my left hand threw off the balance of the entire universe and the world would be destroyed. I believed that, without a doubt. And yet, it had grown back. This body of mine and this new left hand was telling me not to give up my throne. I carry the weighty responsibility of the whole world in one hand. Oh, poor me, who couldn't even brush the dust off my shoulders. What if I were to grow six or seven arms? Or if my left hand were to cover my mouth and suffocate me? The anxiety took over my knee at night. I grew desperate. Since that harsh, blinding summer day when Hoxborough awoke, since that day which left a red, painful memory, we have had to endure our days of suffering. Everything changed drastically. Hoxborough seized your hearts with his skilled storytelling. Even through, through the sound of his chewing food, he stroked each one of your hair blowing his rank breath on you, and said, what do you think lies behind the sky? Someday let's fly there together. These were the words that seduced you. In truth, I cannot hide that I was the first to fall for the words of this huckster. I myself. I doubt anybody can understand the sorrow of an angel that has lost his wings. I wanted to fly high, higher than any place, higher than the sky. Hoxaburo produced, he, he possessed a magnetism that nobody else had. That is why, as I trembled, I spoke tearfully about how wonderful Hoxaburo was and how wonderful it is to fly. Those tears were real, but in retrospect, I despair for that moment. The sky belonged to me in the first place. You cannot just give anyone the privilege of flying. You idiots, <clears throat> ignorant of your own ignorance, grew enamored of each other's non-existent wings. And what was the result? It was the very definition of worship. I woke up from this dream wide right? But you, you continued to believe, fought each other over wings that none of you had. You came to despise the rain and chase the clouds away. You shun the very source of life. The low pressure system that we once monopolized moved away to the west and east, creating a typhoon. And then what happened? Now, this is a perfect example of how easily you are manipulated. I'm not being sardonic when I say that I learned from this experience, you stupid yams. Knowing that you are mere apes easily swayed by fads and eloquence. To worship Hoxborough, you betrayers donned matching sashes around your waists and went to murder mountain. And I sank my teeth into meat in frustration. I knew I had to find out what Hoxborough was using you for. Hoxborough became a star of this island with his genial manner. A mere newcomer, everyone pronounced Hoxborough's name instead of greetings. And uh, everyone wore the sash on this island of everlasting summer. Now, before he came here, Oxaburo was apparently an advisor to a miserable king on another island. With his eloquent speech, it became to be popular with the people. 
And so the vengeful king bought a ship and sent him out to sea. But Huxborough did not arrive at sea. His sunny disposition and his jovial manner attracted people to him. And for that, I was also envious. What destroyed me took place on the first day of winter. And if there are four seasons on this island, you know, it suggests the signal by the blow of the whales that were also precious food sources for you all. And, and, and through the rays of the sun, not much different from the summer. It was then that he took number 128 as his wife. As you all know, number 128 was a well-proportioned, beautiful woman. <laughs> I was secretly in love with her. <laughs> her slender frame and elastic skin reflected the sun's rays, and I loved the way she chirped at me like a grasshopper. That insolent man took her to be his own. He took all the resources here as his own. It was up to me to take number 128 and this whole island back to the way it was before. Take them back! Uh, I took my slave, uh, number uh, 256, uh, to spy on you all, to see what you were doing. And what do you think that you were doing? Oh, it was flabbergasting. I was, it was such a great shock that I lost my hearing again. Do you, do you even understand what you were forced to do there? What? What you were doing as you fawned over a Hoxaborough with a sword at his side and his clumsy words? You cannot even imagine. I had to keep silent about it until now to try to save you from the pain. Now, if by chance there's anyone among you who does know what Hoxaborough had forced you to do, without a doubt, the person you must have learned the truth from, number 256, who would have gone against orders to speak of it. Number 256 had gone against my will, which is a grave act of rebellion. I must punish number 256 immediately. I will execute number 256. Bring me fire. We went to Murder Mountain to spy a Hoxaborough, and you gripped me hard when you saw the unbelievable sight before us. Have you forgotten? We began to tremble from rage and terror, and we pissed ourselves as we could not tear our eyes away from that sight. My eyes have rotted from what we saw, and my ears hear hellish voices. I will never be able to forget what I saw. Have you already forgotten? You, who have no ability to remember? High above us, in the translucent blue sky, that yellow bird, whose hobby it was to attack me, flew about with its piercing cry. That bird was deriding me with that cry. It had come with warning to come and tear me apart again. I cannot forget it. I screamed in anger. You bird, looking down at me from above, you're the one who's stupid. Ten years had passed since Hoxaboro arrived. You primitive natives encircled Hoxaboro, and against the sugarcane field at the foot of Murder Mountain, you pressed your bodies together to practice some tribal dance. You sweated and rushed. Smiling irritably, grinding your pelvis and bumping your butts together, beating a hollow log as an instrument, you made nonsense music, and hot tomorrow, and number 128, danced in white, held hands and danced, cruel drawn in by the cursed rhythm and chants, even number 256, let out a high pitched cry! What are you doing? <laughs> Number 256, how pathetic it is that even you join in. <laughs> how dare all of you convene behind my back as I watch Number 256 shake his hips 
the landscape paled in my eyes. Amidst the sugarcane leaves, Hoxborough stopped the music and dancing and said that he wanted to talk. <laughs> Okay, well, at once I felt relieved and regretful. And I asked him what he wanted to discuss. Hawksborough said, I want everyone to gather together and dance. And I wish your king would join us. That's impossible, what for, I said. The sugar king here grows quickly and is rich in sugar. Let's harvest it together, he said. And do what with it, I asked. We can bring our harvest together and export it and establish trade with the neighboring countries, he said. And what does it have to do with the dance, I asked. I love this island, and this traditional dance is wonderful. I've heard that you don't have much occasion to dance much these days. But why is that? Let's dance once more together in a circle. We can begin trade, and people from different places come to this island. We can show them this valuable dance, he said. Stop leading my subjects. We haven't begun to create tradition. Don't interfere with things that will naturally grow outdated and go extinct. Don't get attached to old values. They will die out on their own. I am implementing a new value system. So I decided to kill You know, I knew I could not permit him to speak anymore. Now, I knew number 256 uh, really coveted that sword of his. So I made him cooperate by saying that he could have it if he killed him. You know, everything I did, I did for you. I am responsible for not recognizing Hoxaburro's joyride. I had to restore everything to the straight line it had been. One day, amongst the days that we're trying to grow longer, uh, number uh, 256 lured Hoxaburro to see a rare boulder in Modesty Bay. And when Hoxaburro excitedly asked where the boulder was, using a time honored method, we picked up random rocks and threw them, at, threw them at him from afar and finally did it! High above. The bird circled high with a terrible cry. What is close to the sun remains close. What is far remains far. No matter how you change your form, you will be no match for me. Silence, bird! We debated who had struck Hoxaburro with the fatal blow. And after a long and boring time, we ultimately settled on the fact that Hoxaburro died alone. Foolish Hoxaburro! Why haven't you fought back with a sword? Number, 50, 150, number 256 only had stones, and the sun set. Stop chattering. How many times have I had to say this? Haven't you had enough? Do you want to go back to the days when Hoxaburro tricked you into believing you all could fly? After I warned you so vehemently to be careful? Oh, I've reached my limit. You are all truly imbeciles. Well, not to nothing. Every one of you with a vapid look. You're worthless, all, you're utterly worthless. Always seeking mistakes, getting distracted. What are you? You imbeciles. Has nobody ever told you that before? So let me tell you, as a representative of everyone else, <laughs> that you're beyond saving. You are obsessed with meaningless garbage and stay up all night. You're always like that. You are beyond saving. You have to go to the river to spit out trivial worries and meaningless chatter. You eat food as you bubble over with anxiety. You fart loudly from your mouths and lie during training. You lift your legs like shameless frogs. You're hopeless. You've been taught your worthlessness, yet you remain complacent. Your delusions are weeds that bloom tirelessly every morning. Since Hoxburg died, you've become restless. The low pressure system you chased away to clear the clouds so you could fly created a typhoon over the seas, and countless ships have come to this island to avoid it. The bird cried as it flew parallel over the ships, and the whales were hunted by whaling ships. I think I can hear that 
eerie birds cry now? Would a beastly bird? No, wait. No, wait, that's, that's a different sound. No, it's a sound I detest. Of course, my heart is leaping from its chest. I must go. I, 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 I am being summoned. However, I will not hide. For the sake of the future, I must not crumble now. You must stay here. Prepare for battle. My subjects, if you're going to stop me, stop me now. <laughs> Once I leave, you may never, I may never return. You won't have anyone to leave you. Can you live with that? Your all-powerful king is about to leave you. Can you really live with that? Look, I've already taken a step. I'm one step farther from you. Are you sure? Okay, okay. I, of course, I can survive alone. It's easy for me to survive. I can do it. Of course, I can. So you're, you're sure? You're really sure? I've already walked 10 steps. <laughs> I'm 10 steps away. I speak out of compassion for your sake. Of course I'm not disappointed. All right, damn it. No one's going to stop me. Who cares? I'm going. No, I've already taken 50 steps. Uh, your king is getting farther away. Without someone to discipline you, the earth will crack and you will have nothing. The chaos that erupts you then will destroy you. Don't come crying to me later. I'll be, I'll, I'll be looking down on you from high above you, swatching you strangled by chaos, you wretches. I'm really going. So you won't have any regrets? Regret always comes too late. Of course, I don't care. I'm actually joyful at leaving this place. So it's really all right then? Okay, all right. You're not going to miss me, even when I'm gone. I've taken 100 steps. It's really painful. It's really painful to feel left behind. Okay, Dad, you sure? <laughs> all right, then I'm going. I'll be right back. Rejoice! Your king has returned! Sing! Now is the time to call back the storms. The storms you chased away. You are all truly imbeciles. You will amount to nothing. Every one of you with a vapid look. Wait, wait, hold on. Have I said that before? <laughs> You imbeciles, with your heads spinning, you're, all, you're truly beyond saving. Always chasing cats! Wait, have I, have I said that before? So what happened, you imbeciles? You, the low pressure system you chased away to clear the sky, created a typhoon over the seas, and countless ships have come to this island to avoid it. I've already said that. Memory is a living thing. I only moved a little bit this time. I could have been moved with more force. I need more endurance. Perhaps a larger continental plate will help. <laughs> the quake we had before was much larger. Too bad. My subjects, your, your ancestors started, startled by the quake, clung to me for help with clumsy tears and snot. To be honest, I felt only scorn for them. Have you learned nothing about your, from your education? I bestowed upon you all with my spirit. They were trembling with fear. There were times when I, even I lose my cool. Warriors must be prepared for anything. If your king is unstable, you must be strong in his stead. By comparison, that young jewel John was amazing. He was a fisherman's son who gladly took to the seas. Before, because of the low pressure system you chased away, John's flimsy fishing boat capsized, and the uncontrollable half sunk boat came to me. It crashed into the cliffs of Montessi Bay and was destroyed. Uh, John escaped ashore with his life, and for a while he escaped from 
Number 512, who hurled rocks at him out of curiosity and lived on a diet of grass at night. John stole whale meat, number 512, had stored in number 512, angered, collected many rocks, and chased John around while John cried out for peace, and this ridiculous squabbling continued. Nourished by the protein and iron and the whale meat, John traversed the island freely and crossed Birthane River by walking on the back of the barely living 10,100-year-old alligator. Seeing this, number 512 was enraged, but he did not follow suit. Poor number 512, kneeling by the dying alligator. He held its head, trying to ignore its voice, though he thought he was pledging allegiance to the alligator. The gator did not say anything at this time. If he did, all he said was this. My back is like my belly, and my head is clanging like thunder. What are you talking about, you idiot? This sad alligator had no offspring in sight. In fact, a long time ago, he did have a happy family, but his children had died before him, and now he spends his old age alone. John, driven by instinct born of hunger, called the alligator again and again to try to capture it, but the old alligator still had legs to escape. So the despair he felt was intense. John jumped onto Bird Hat Rock in Mossy Bay to eat moss and scream into the ocean spray. I want to fish, but I don't have a fishing pole. I don't need both of these arms if I can't build a boat. His cry shot straight out east, following a whale to where a whaling ship was hunting it. That whaling ship, Tiara, was drawn to John's powerful voice and approached me. John, the owner of such a beautiful, robust voice, Immediately afterwards, John got sick from eating sea moss, lost his voice, and came within an inch of his life when he was rescued by Captain Guillermo of the whaling ship. I don't know much about the captain, but he gave John, who was half dead, some bread, and John was deeply moved and bounced back to his old social self and worked hard, and Guillermo liked John, hard worker that he was. So he took John back to his home country. Sadly, John was overjoyed to board Guillermo's ship. However, my subjects, there is no need of despair. There is a silver lining to everything. Even coincidences can be explained if you look at the logic of the world. There were two men. Two men. Who were disgusted with Guillermo's operations on his ship. Cristobal and Renault. Newcomers to the story. They were sick with the cruelty and danger of their work on the ship and asked for permission to disembark. The profiles of their faces as they watched the fishing ship Tiara depart were lit by the sun in such a way that it looked like it would never set. Their expressions fitted between anticipation and anxiety. You prepared to throw rocks at them in alarm, but they offered you turtle, shrimp, and sardines, prepared with new technology. And we were all shocked by the enchanting flavor. Their friendliness drew us out. Compelled by their affable smiles and the rarity of their presence, everyone on the island decided to learn their language so they could greet them. In this wide universe, in which innumerable stars live and die over spans of time, these two were extremely knowledgeable. They had left their homes behind and were traveling the world, at times riding whaling ships and living as they liked. Um, the Cristobal was the son of Dominica. Dominica was the son of Bartholomew. Bartholomew was the son of Bartholomew. Bartholomew was the son of Diego. Diego, it was said, could move the stars and change the seasons as he wished. Renal was from the continent, but his mother was from one of our islands. And he spoke passionately of wanting to explore his roots, to see the land where he came from. While well, Cristobal, if he had something on his mind, finished off the moonshine he bootlegged from the whaling ship. We all thought that was a bit odd. Cristobal Renal talked to us about the area around our ocean when we rode out to sea in a small hybrid boat, bobbing with white waves against the sunset, so gorgeous that it made you want to stab someone. A, a million sun rays shone on our backs. I learned all about myself. We are positioned one day away from the continent when traveling at 20 knots an hour. Two islands to the north and three islands to the west 
complete this archipelago. And this island at the center is the only one with fresh water. There have been many animals and uh, plant life that understood human language, but now most of them were nearly extinct. Uh, number uh, 1024 tried to make trees and animals nearly talk to him, but he lost his patience when they didn't respond. And, and so he jumped into the night sea and swam so vigorously that he hit his pinky on the ocean floor and just stayed in injury. Cristobal Renal taught us an innumerable variety of things. Uh, after we collected all the information we thought we needed from them, we first uh, smoked Renal to preserve him. Oh. <laughs> and um, minced Cristobal and ate him. We prepared what remained the way that you prepare whale meat by boiling the flesh in order to draw out the fat. And then we sold them to other civilized people who had come in multitudes to our island, and we traded them for modern communities like soap and toothpaste. While new people came and walked freely on our shores with their shoes, we rekindled our bonfires and enjoyed them for a while. I felt at ease, seeing your smiling faces for the first time in a while. Fire has a mysterious power to calm our hearts throughout the ages. In the dark, I pictured each one of your faces and heard only your breath and that wind back then. <laughs> and in a moment, several years passed. In the bay where I prepared the beach after the last earthquake, a plume of black smoke rose and several explosions burst. And the yellow bird cried louder than it had ever cried before but that cry was meaningless. And then, after a while, three men uh, named Townsend, John, and Shang Wen came ashore at the space of our honey. I cannot forget the day that I had an audience with them. Uh, they came to visit me, uh, who reigned as the great king, and they had to squint in the presence of my brilliant dignity and they bowed deeply as they would to someone revered around the world. And then, after some religious or customary hand gestures, which I didn't understand, they spoke. By the way, John translated Townsend's language, A, into Cristobal and Bernard's language, Cristobal and Bernard's language, B. And uh, number 2048, he would accept an old persistence and hunger for knowledge of Cristobal Renal's language, B, translated into my language, C. Okay, uh, this is th what Townsend said was, In preparation to govern this island, we shall stay here for a while and conduct a survey. Tell us what you know about this island. And then uh, John translated that into Cristobal and Renal's language. Vamos a pasar un rato en esta isla para establecer el gobierno y e investigar todos los lados de aquí. Cuéntenos de esta isla, de lo que ella sabe. Now, now, although perplexed, number 2048 told me what, what, what they had said, and so I answer. I see. It must have been difficult to travel across the seas just to see me in the flesh. Do you have a place to sleep? If you like, my people will prepare such a place at incredible speed, so you may enjoy your stay here comfortably for a while. However, though I'm sure you already are aware, you must not deceive or otherwise behave strangely to vex me, the king. Don't think you can fool my angel eyes. I give this warning from my compassionate heart, so make sure you receive it with gratitude. Number 2048 cannot translate this. <laughs> he does his best, gesturing wildly. John nods silently. Townsend seems satisfied with the kind reception that would have made a shrimp applaud. And continues. Ha! 
How long have you been living in this island for? Uh, John translates that into Chris Balranov's language. ¿Cuánto tiempo han vivido aquí? Number 2848 speaks to me on the verge of tears. I answer. Of course, I have the final say, but I will give you a satisfied feast to keep your bellies here and the rain away. Unfortunately, we have no one here who can be called chefs. We used to have excellent chefs, but no longer. Instead, we could share with you some fine smoked meat. But I must say, to be safe, that it depends on your attitude. However, being a miser does nothing. Nay, I insist, we will share it with you. Number 2048, slice and serve the smoked Renault. Number 2048 cannot translate this. Anyway, he presents John with the smoked Renault. John grins and bites into the meat. Townsend continues. How many people are living here? And where are you from? John translates. ¿Cuántas personas han emigrado aquí? ¿Y de dónde son ustedes? Number 2048 is stone still. We are prepared to give you the nationality of our country, if you wish. Les daríamos la nacionalidad de nuestro país a ustedes si la quisieran. Mm, uh -huh. We know that you have been living in this island for a long time, and we shall see to it that you can continue to live the same way. Sabemos que ustedes viven en esta isla por mucho tiempo, y les dejaríamos vivir con el mismo modo que ahora. Enough of this nonsense. Are you referring to our oil? I can share our smoked meats with you, but the oil belongs to me. It's a crucial resource for foreign exchange at a time when the number of residents is growing. And I don't intend to have that politically delicate conversation with the likes of you. I would be willing to sell you oil in the amount that you need. I would consider that. But that would only be out of charity. So it's not open to negotiation. Do with you whatever I want. A heavy silence and a staring match between Townsend and number 2048. His shoulders droop and he sighs. Townsend accepts my terms quickly with a dubious face. Chung Wang never opened his mouth. And John, who may have been the same guy who fought the, fought the 10,150-year-old alligator, he just bit into an apple and grinned. What is wrong with this guy? Townsend did not make any offerings to me. Instead, he took the grinning John and the silent Chung Wang and returned to his ship. The three of them seemed to have grown attached to the island because it did not seem like they had any intention of leaving. One after another, people from their three mother countries arrived on our island in droves and settled. They built houses large and small and opened noodle soup shops and disgusting shops where customers sit defenseless as a stranger cuts their hair from behind. <laughs> the bravest of us, uh, number 2096, he went into that shop and came screaming out five minutes later, but then he whistled nonchalantly. However, all of the others were overcome by their fears and offered meaningless prayers to me. I wanted to engage in the activity of cutting my hair. And I realize now that was my first moment of jealousy. I, I didn't know whether it was yesterday or last year, but on a half moon day when that yellow bird flew away into the blue cloud, I learned from reading the writing that they brought that jealousy destroys lives. My subject, jealousy is a terrible snake that can make you suffocate those you love. So keep your distance from it. And if you think you might fall prey to jealous behavior, Train your muscles on the daily battle. Our battle is not yet ended. 
We must never let our guard down. Doesn't anybody remember the tragedy of number 8192? You ignorant pigs. How can you live without knowing? The despair I feel is how I feel if my hard-earned hat were used as a garbage can. In the year of unusually cold winds, fresh in my memory, a shining black insect-like battleship appeared in the bay, and a swarm of soldiers came ashore wielding sticks. They selected the strongest of our islanders and bolted them into the army, and surprisingly, number 8192, who would never like conflict and always sat quietly in the corner, joined their ranks fearlessly. They burned down our forest. They turned our athletic field into an airstrip and landed fighter planes that flew faster than the yellow bird and let out grand farts. Every time I heard that noise, I jumped as if something, somebody were beating my head out of a slumber. And when my back began to itch, <laughs> it was a kind of ecstasy. I reveled in the weight of the new construction I'd never felt before. Our oil did not sell. Anyway, our new buildings were built. And all your homes were torn down. Anyone who didn't join the army was forced to evac evacuate inland. And so most of you left me. At the time, my feelings were very conflicted. Simply put, conflicted. But of course, I, who mo am the most diligent of all in the universe, was also making discoveries. My subjects, place your hands on your hearts now. Revel in the fact that you were able to meet me, your fearless king, an agent of the heavens. If you didn't have me, your existence would be non-existent. And remind yourself never to repeat that immeasurable solitude that resulted from you leaving my side, albeit temporarily. I am your mother, your father, your oldest brother, and your youngest brother. Come, repeat my words. I am your mother. I am your mother. Your father. Your father. Your oldest brother. Your oldest brother. And your youngest brother. And your youngest brother. After everyone left, I focused my awareness on my ears. <laughs> in meditation, quietly by myself. Every type of war machine came to bother me from all directions. And white, black, and red, and yellow, brown people arrived. And they fought and burned and ate each other over and over and over. There were so many explosions that many of my ears were destroyed. I smelled only gunpowder. My skin peeled, my fingers broke. Countless people died, and number 8192 cried in despair as he jumped into the sea. And yet I did not lose my spirit, and I accepted everything as it came. My spirit may be the foundation to the stability I have reached. Several airplanes fell into what remained of the forest, and plumes of smoke rose up. The top a murder mountain was flattened, and Hermit Crab Beach was littered with corpses. And many birds left. I looked at my belly and my arms reflected in the mirror of the ocean, and I was surprised at how much I had changed. But I discovered a strange buoyancy and pleasure as well. On a sunny day, the birds spoke to me from the white sky with its cursed voice, and I decided to ignore it. If you have some water, some water can I drink? I'm thirsty, thirst overcomes me. Though I am an angel, my feet are bound by invisible chains. I cannot use my wings to get away from you. I cannot fly in search of water. That yellow bird was not joking. Man's war had driven it mad, and it had forgotten how to take care of itself. I didn't even glance at the bird. But instead, I focused on my body, where I was, and what I had, how I had changed. I observed every corner and rejoiced in my daily discoveries of my new self. After a brief, peaceful, uninhabited period, a horde from the big nation came ashore. And I jumped to greet them. 
with my newly transformed self, but I could hardly understand their language. But the newcomers offered me gifts. Uh, two bulldozers, uh, two scraper dozers, two excavators, two wheel loaders, three jump trucks, uh, uh, two crawler cranes, two forklifts, two Armandaria work pro, uh, platform, an earth drill, a, a vacuum truck, a road roller, a motor grader, a mud mixer, an asphalt plant, and an asphalt fixer. I accepted them without airs. It's easy to see the prosperity of the big nation in just any one of these gifts. It is best to defer to the powerful, to learn from their knowledge and strategies and methods of distress. I thought this. <laughs> into laughter. My subjects, uh, the people of this new nation have a method called landfill. <laughs> and though uh, through this, they've expanded my surface area. So my transformation has surpassed that of a king. I greet this new physical formation with ease, and I keep changing every day and I learned the pleasurable sensation of my heart being warmed. Libraries that can store vast quantities of books and towers reaching the sun were built. Innumerable people populated me. This island and, uh, and, and, and Hermit Crab Beach, though that name is no longer used. And when people began to sear their skins on the beach or hide themselves in the jungle, you returned. Masses of nuclear submarines and cruise ships and yachts came. The airport, equipped with modern communication devices, welcomed passenger flights and helicopters. Everyone dove into the sea, as if probing my belly, digging big holes and shouting naked. You must remember well those nameless people who came to your sunless villages to hire you to resurrect and harvest the sugarcane fields. You sweated under their management to harvest all that sugarcane. Apparently, they needed it to uh, provide biomass ethanol. It was the rumor uh, uh, start spread by number 16384, who learned the language eagerly. Now, there are other trees and flowers unique to this island that have grown countless scientists to sniff around. <laughs> it's ticklish. I can't even stand it now. They will probably surround me. And a lot of different people with louder voices will come here. I was the chosen one. However, it has become too lively, and I do think it's bothered some. But I, I will keep that a secret. I will only share my thoughts with you, my subjects. Rejoice. In order to protect the production of biomass ethanol, the scientists have insisted that they must bring giant, fearsome frogs to eat the pests that are decimating the sugarcane fields. A plan that was approved at a meeting in which I had no say. The frogs were brought from the continent, and they bred prolifically in an instant, and by the same fate that I was carried by the water and wind when I was at sea, they were poisonous. The frogs took over the asphalt built by Townsend and the neighborhoods that were built on what used to be our fields, and they cry out to their heart's content night after night. Stop talking nonsense! My subjects, how many days have gone by? I cannot trust my memory. But as your all-powerful king, I want to show you the way to the future. If you can, do this. Kill the poisonous frogs. <laughs> they exert no effort. They live however they want. They sleep and shit as they like. My tolerance is as deep as the sea. But these creatures I cannot accept. Soldiers, are you ready? You must destroy every single one of them. Raise your voices, get off your butts, and take a stance. You ain't vegetables.
vegetables and prepared your digestive systems for this very moment. All the taxes you paid were invented for this purpose. I do not want them to leave a mark on my history. They have not given an ounce of sweat. They drink, eat, and breathe all the oxygen they want. Shut the doors. I want some of you who survive on the allowance of your children sent home from the continent. There are others who, against their will, dig in the park, dig in the dirt, dig part of me, wasting an entire day looking for a potato. And yet others went naively out on the continent without even knowing how to buy a ticket and committed suicide out of homesickness. Our native language has changed, and I know you have suffered. That aged alligator has not been seen since. Nobody remains to speak my language. No one to voice complaints. My subjects, you, might disappear soon. That bird, that bird that attacked me relentlessly, ate a poison frog and died. I did not know that that bird which ruled the sky boldly with its terrible wings held profound meaning for each and every one of you. That bird danced in the blue sky, protected this island. It was your angel, the king of the sky, your god. Earthbound, I might have envied that bird. I can only wait for the shifting tectonic plates. Let us at least avenge that bird, my eternal rival. My subjects, you are as good as gone. Many people will likely demand what is mine, but I will only continue to transform into myself. But for what did I ever have the desire to change? You do not know how to proceed, but don't worry. If you die, I will collect your bones. To be exact, I will absorb you into myself. So kill, kill them all. They will keep coming back no matter how many you kill. So kill as many as you can before you die. My valiant soldiers, be brave and go forth.
guess I could this is part of the show. Yeah, it's, I think it might be easier. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> You're going to sound like a I'll sound like an alligator. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you so much. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for your wonderful performance. Uh, again, <laughs> spectacular. Um, and thank you all for being here. Thank you for staying. Um, and um, I would like to start asking you a question, you die. Um, and my first question is, how do you feel watching your play in English? And uh, how is that experience for you different from you know, seeing your, your play in another language, yeah. Okay. Um, hello. I'm Yuda Kamisato. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Tony and Sarah for your great job, and Frank and all the staff for the, the Seagull Center to invite me. I'm very honored to be here and to talk with your audience. And then I speak in Japanese. まずえっとこの作品2015年に書いたんですけども。I <laughs> <laughs> wrote this play in 2015。えっと自分で演出をしてえその時は一人の俳優でっていうのはできなかったので。I uh, directed that production myself um, and for that production, I was not able to have it performed by a single actor. So I, I put it on with, with five actors, and I took the text, and I split it amongst the five performers. So my, my first reaction is just such a gratitude and joy in having one performer take on all the text. で、あの、なんかえっと、あったんですけど、その書き方として、でもなんていうか日本語では出ないなんていうんですかね、あの強さとなんていうかファニーな感じとっていうのがあったと思います。And I actually think that this particular piece is really well suited for translation, meaning there are some things I think that uh, play better in English, like the, the humor of it. Um, and the power of it that uh, doesn't come through in the same way in, in the Japanese, actually. Japanese, I mean, I'm not sure how it lands in the English, but in, in the Japanese, there's a a sense of it um, feeling a little bit um, like old, like not not dated, but uh, it feels a little bit like, uh, um, yeah, like a little bit distant. It's like formal, in sense, yeah. yeah. Formal, yes. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, so. Um, Tony, I, I wanted to, to ask you how you have engaged with um, a character that has so many dimensions that it's hard to understand if it's a person or if it's the island itself talking or if it's um, a character that lives across centuries and you know has so, so many dimensions and how has it been for you the process of engaging with all those different layers and well, you know, there's a line where I say, I will tell you the truth like climbing a mountain. And, uh, you know, engaging with a text like this is like climbing a mountain. And, you know, uh, Sarah and I met at the base camp and like, go like, holy, <laughs> this is a big mountain to climb. So it's really the sort of thing where you can only really uh, tackle such a huge thing step by step. So we just went through it moment by moment and tried to construct it out of d the details, you know. And um, I'm, f 
fortune, the one fortunate thing I think I have as an actor is I don't have an imagination that says, wait a second, I'm a, per I'm a dictator and I'm also an island? That makes no sense to me. <laughs> really, I mean, everything makes sense to me. I don't have, <laughs> so um, I, the one thing I think I do have was that I never said, well, this is absurd. This makes no sense. I just try to commit to everything purely as it happened. And if you follow the logic of the piece, it's perfectly understandable how he could be speaking as an individual and as an uh, inanimate object at the same time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, so Sarah, Sarah Hughes, the director um, of the reading, thank you so much for your work. Great job. <laughs> um, and I was going to ask you something similar, um, considering the richness of the metaphors and the historical references that come in so many directions in, in the play. And also, because it comes from a different culture, how do you, how have you engaged with all those, um, those metaphors, but as well with the cultural translation, perhaps? Um, Uh, we, uh, yeah, we met a number of times, um, and like Tony said, it was about um, trying to pay attention to the details and kind of score out um, this mountain of text into um, f little, little ways that we could ground it and kind of help the audience find their footing. Um, uh, and I think that sometimes the metaphors serve that, um, and then sometimes, uh, you know, we would try to find something more uh, literal or tangible so that uh, a metaphor could actually be heard, that you could hear how poetic and beautiful a uh, description of the landscape was, but you can only do that when you have something to kind of look at in that moment. Um, that was kind of where we came to really trying to engage directly with different audience members and also with the stupid little toys um, <laughs> <laughs> because it just gives you some, some little shape to hold on to for a moment um, so the descriptions can kind of flow out of that. Um, and then I also asked Aya a lot of, and you die a lot of questions about um, which metaphors might be uh, calling up a more familiar Japanese idiom that I might not know, um, and which ones you know, were just a sort of beautiful and strange and lovely description. Um, so she, they were very helpful with that too. Thank you so much. So I actually wanted to ask you Aya, a question as well, and um, I think you, that you already started answering this with um, the difference in the way humor works in English and in Japanese, but I was going to ask you um, about your translation process as well, and, if, and the difficulties you might have encountered, and how do you feel as well about the way the humor is different in the language in Japanese and in, and in English? Um, it's, that's a difficult question for me to answer right at this moment because my brain is in a little bit in translator mode, <laughs> which means I'm, I'm trying to be blank. Um, but that's really also the way I approach texts, which is um, blankly. Um, of course, he, he's, there's a conversation here and you know I approach him with questions. He also sends me video of his work, um, but oftentimes um, the videos uh, give me a general sense, but I don't, um, I actually just go off the page really and, um, and what I know and the relationship that we have built um, and what I know of him and what I know of his body of work, I allow that to inform me. So. Um, I mean, I, I found the humor in the Japanese very much uh, mm -hmm. present, um, but I also think that um, his work landing with a Japanese audience is different from his work landing with an American audience. Yeah. Um, so, like, mm -hmm. I mean, 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 I mean
メリカの会社と出っていう違いもあるんじゃないかいやあると思います、うん、あとその翻訳のことで言うと僕は最一番の違いというか難しいんじゃないかと思ったのはあのこの戯曲は意図的に主語をカットしてるのでその私がこう個人ではなくて最終的に島だっていう種明かしが最後の最後でできるようになんていうかずっとこうぼやかしてその主語をやってたんですけど英語の場合ってそれができないじゃないですかだからそこはすごくなんていうかあの今後。のクリエーションにあたってその翻訳するっていうことを前提にした時にあまり使えないというかちょっとこれから改善していこうと思っているところで,そうです。So yes, I, I also think that there's a difference between the, the audiences in, in Japan and the US, but for this particular piece I feel like one of the difficult things in terms of translation was that I wrote this in Japanese deliberately、uh, without Using、um, uh, pronouns、uh, so that it's, it's deliberately unclear、um, who the speaker is until the very end.、Um, so, so, using that、um, it's aspect of, of Japanese where you don't have to specify、um, who the speaker is or the pronoun. Um, that kind of opens up to interpretation. Well, is it, is it a human? Is it a dictator? Is it an island? You know, to create a deliberately blurry line there, which、um, obviously an English subject verb object、um, has, has to be clear. So moving forward, I would like to be、uh, more mindful that I,、uh, I'm thinking about the translation at, at the beginning of the writing process.、Um, Knowing that I can't use, I can't depend on that aspect of、uh, Japanese syntax. Thank you. Yes.、Um, of course, it creates an interesting texture even in the translation, because even using those subjects as you did in the translation, you still, the, an ambiguity does come across.、Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting thing, right? A slipperiness, you know. Um, and Tony, I wanted to ask you as you were building your character and your dictator、um, who self, self identifies as an angel and then as a king, and it's a, an impossible combination of narcissistic and、um, emotional and tyrannical and abusive. And、um, I was wondering if, if there are.、Um, yeah, I know nobody like that right now. There's nobody in our public life who's anywhere similar to that. <laughs> There's no incredibly narcissistic person who's, a, who's powerful and delusional that we are all aware of. I can't even begin to think who you might be referring to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah I was, I was going to ask <laughs> if,、um, if there were some inspiration anywhere in, in reality or, or if you had any reference. Well, <laughs> because of my personal feelings about the person in question, I couldn't base my characterization on him because then I wouldn't be able to invest in. Personal identification. But it's great actually. <clears throat> it may be a problem for the world at large, but it's fantastic and fascinating to have.、Uh, um, and it's not just the person who you might be thinking I'm referring to. I mean, we're right now, worldwide,、uh, we're seeing a great renaissance of the autocrat. So there are many, many examples of this sort of megalomaniacal. Person in constant fugue state actually running countries. So I had an embarrassment of riches to、uh, reach into. Absolutely. Well, you did a great job, and it, it was.、Um... The only thing to really identify yourself positively with these people is you just think of them as children. You think of them as wayward, spoiled, awful children. And that kind of was a nice thing. Sarah brought in these toys, and that really helped me. Because I was able to project these horrible things onto the idea of just like a little boy stuck in a room who might be in really, really difficult circumstances, who is working out their problems from destroying and killing toys. So that playfulness was a real helpful key 
uh, to uh, the stuff we, we worked on together. And, and, and there was in, uh, certainly empathy from us, I think, because, because you really yeah. got to, to, to that tenderness. Yeah, um, yeah thank you. Um, and we have Peter Eckersall with us. Uh, he's a professor in the Department of Theater. And um, I wanted to know if you could um, maybe, if, if you could tell us how you position this play within a larger context of contemporary playwriting in, in Japan, <laughs> if that's, that's a, an easy that's question. That's a very <laughs> difficult question to answer in a very short amount of time, but um, I was just remembering that uh, earlier in the year we had a visit from um, a very well-known professor from Japan named Professor Uchino Tadashi, who gave a lecture here uh, using the work of a Japanese philosopher named uh, um, I think it's uh, Azuma Hiroki, uh, and his, his lecture was on the philosophy of the tourist and the idea of, uh, um, of course, Japanese people are famous for being tourists, but also colonialism is a kind of tourism in a certain kind of <laughs> monarchical kind of uh, obsessional fascistic kind of way. Um, and he talked about your play, actually, in this lecture um, quite a lot. And, uh, and so I was thinking, remembering the lecture and talking about... Uh, this perspective and, and listening to the play. Because um, the play is also a kind of tourism of, uh, of um, singular totalitarian characters. And there's a lot of reference or possible references, not just to kind of living fuckwits, but, um, um, but to historical figures or literary figures. You know, I was thinking of Ubu, for example, as an obvious one. But also, at a certain point, I started thinking about. Um, uh, uh, not a not a totalitarian figure, but um, the character of Crap in Crap's Last Take, because there's this sort of kind of Beckettian sort of obsession or loss in the in the past, and this blurring of, of fictional realities and and historical realities, and uh, and so there's the, a kind of tourism through certain frameworks or, or kind of narratives within theatre, and of course there's a mixture of real characters and events and. Um, I presume Townsend's Tales in Harris, the first uh, 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 the first American consul general to Japan after the uh, after the opening up of Jap quote unquote opening up of Japan to the West in the Meiji Restoration, and so there's various other historical references that were really resonating for me, and I was also thinking a little bit about Okinawa and the status that Okinawa has in uh, in the Japanese uh, landscape and the fact that that used to be a kingdom and. Um, and so there were many references. So I know I'm not answering your question, but in, I am to the extent that it's rare that you have a Japanese play that is so, um, I guess, interested in this kind of rich intertextuality that is not just, a, there's a lot of Japanese intertextuality in, in other plays. Um, uh, my dear friend Kamura Takeshi has intertextuality in that he always references popular culture, but it's rare for somebody to reference a whole kind of history of theatre, I think, in, in, in subtle ways. So, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So, um, before we open to the public, just one last question, um, because, Sarah, I know that you directed um, another one of uh, Yudai's play, um, Aviación 51, sorry. <laughs> 51. Yeah. Yes, um, uh, for the Pen Voices Festival here a couple of years back. So if you could just tell us a little bit about, about that experience and just working together again. Um, yeah, um, I guess um, something that struck me about both of, both of those, both that play and this play um, is, you know, like I said at the beginning, um, this interest in sort of nationhood and um, what it means to be a citizen and uh, what it means to sort of have ownership over that, um, but then also formally um, with with these two plays um, and one uh, one other play from a playwright who's very different, um, uh, but also contemporary Japanese writer. Um, just this um, t willingness to um, embrace the use of a a lot of text, a mountain of text, um, uh, and trust a really trusting the audience to be able to kind of hang on to the threads that are being put forth and follow them, um, uh, which I just have found really thrilling um, and is um, something that I think 
sometimes with contemporary American uh, writing, um, I feel like there's less of a trust in the audience um, to kind of be able to track a very complex, dense, and discursive um, piece of writing. Um, so that that has been thrilling. I mean, there were some shared themes between um, this play and the, and um, Aviación San Borja, but um, yeah, I sort of talked about those already. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're gonna open it to the audience. Um, if anybody has questions, right there, yeah. Um, please speak to the mic. Sure, um, were there references to Japanese legends or mythologies? And the second question is regarding not using the pronouns and at the end revealing um, who the, the, main, the character is. In the, in the play we heard just now, was that at the very end, the bit where I am, I am, I am, and, and uh, Tony's out in the middle of the floor and, and reciting the different things he is. is that, was that the part in the play where, in Japanese, it's revealed who, who the character is? Yes, thank you. えっと、まず1つ目の質問に関してなんですけども、あの、これはえっと第二次世界大戦前に日本で流行していた漫画がモチーフになってます。So in an answer to your first question, um I I was very much um uh, uh, influenced by a manga, a comic book that was uh, very popular in Japan before World War II. で、それ、その漫画ではその子供がある子供、日本人の子供がこう釣りをしてたら寝てしまって気づいたら南の島にたどり着いていて、で、そこでこう実際に番号を振ってこう原住民にでその日本大日本帝国の素晴らしい文明
I just, <coughs> even though all, all of these influences that I just talked about were from pre-World War II, I felt like there's actually a lot of resonance to what's happening in the world right now. So it was an effort on my part to kind of reflect back to that part of history. Um, and uh, although it, it might feel um, uh, somewhat biased um, or, or there's a lot of prejudice ingrained in, in, those, in those stories, but um, feeling the need to revisit them. その、プレートが動くっていうので、まあなんとなくわかるようにはなってるんですけど、えっと、鳥が新、黄色い鳥が新で、え、彼がライバルだったとか、彼がこそがこう天使だったみたいなことを認めるときにわかるっていうようにし
and in the same time sometimes also foreigner because it also I was hosting uh, plus 51 of uh, a Biozong Sang Burja when it was performed in my city so the same place both of those plays really refers to someone like strangers as also foreigners in terms of you know encounter with natives and the kind of encounter become really complicated and sophisticated in philosophically and also uh, in top of cultural background, something like that. And as we know, you guys also grew up in Peru. So this kind of, you know, uh, and this kind of, you know, double consciousness between like Peru or uh, Tokyo is also quite an interesting and captivating part of the way we see the play in different perspective as a tourist, stranger or foreigners. Uh, but one thing that I want to ask to you guys is the way is captivated through numbers because the way he put a lot of numbers in this play and also uh, plus 51 via Song Sang Burja as well. So if could you please like say something is that something that is numbers in the play play important things. Thank you. Thank you. Is that true in San Borja? Plus 51. <laughs> in the title? That's the title. Because of your grandma in Peru, right? This is the title. 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 数が少ないけど、どんどんどんどんこう加速していくっていうのがまあ歴史もそうだなと思うので、まあそういう意味合いを込めてあの倍掛けにしました。So for this particular piece, yes, um, numbers did have quite a significance in terms of the the way it the play builds upon itself. At first, the numbers start small and single digits, and they grow. In smaller increments, but as the as the play goes on, um, they begin to jump quite far, um, and we get into four-digit numbers. And so it's I, I feel like that's the way I, I wanted to show the span of time and the span of change. But I also feel like the increasing velocity um, of the numbers and the way they they grow and jump um, is also reflective of how we perceive history as well. まあ、なのでなんていうかこう後半に向かってだんだんこうなんていうか落ち着かない感じになっていけばいいかなと思って作りました。です。まあ、それが最終的にもうなんていうかこう限界に来ちゃってもうなんか訳わかんなくなるっ